introduction to winter poems by favorite american poets this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org winter poems by favorite american poets introduction in winter poems the publishers offer a holiday book having special appropriateness to the season the first poem the pageant was written expressly for this volume the other poems combine the elements of wide popularity seasonableness and fitness for illustration it is believed that the variety and beauty of the designs and the excellence of the engraving and printing will commend the volume to the highest favour of the public. End of introduction. The Pageant by John Greenleaf Whittier Read for LibriVox.org by Rita Buchos The Pageant a sound as if from bells of silver or elfin cymbals smitten clear through the frost pictured panes i hear a brightness which outshines the morning a splendour brooking no delay beckons and tempts my feet away i leave the trodden village highway for virgin snow-paths glimmering through a jewelled elm-tree avenue where keen against the walls of sapphire the gleaming tree boles ice embossed hold up their chandeliers of frost i tread in orient halls enchanted i dream the saga's dream of caves gem lit beneath the north sea waves i walk the land of el dorado i touch its mimic garden bowers its silver leaves and diamond flowers the flora of the mystic mine world around me lifts on crystal stems the petals of its clustered gems what miracle of weird transforming is this wild work of frost and light this glimpse of glory infinite this foregleam of the holy city like that to him of patmos given the white bride coming down from heaven how flash the ranked and mail-clad alders through what sharp glancing spears of reeds the brook its muffled water leads yon maple like the bush of horeb burns unconsumed a white cold fire rays out from every grassy spire each slender rush and spike of mullein low laurel shrub and drooping fern transfigured blaze where'er i turn how yonder ethiopian hemlock crowned with his glistening circlet stands what jewels light his swarthy hands here where the forest opens southward between its hospitable pines as through a door the warm sun shines the jewels loosen on the branches and lightly as the soft winds blow fall tinkling on the ice below and through the clashing of their cymbals i hear the old familiar fall of water down the rocky wall where from its wintry prison breaking in dark and silence hidden long the brook repeats its summer song one instant flashing in the sunshine keen as a sabre from its sheath then lost again the ice beneath i hear the rabbit lightly leaping the foolish screaming of the jay the chopper's axe-stroke far away the clamour of some neighbouring barnyard, the lazy cock's belated crow, or cattle tramp in crispy snow. And, as in some enchanted forest, the lost knight hears his comrades sing, and near at hand their bridles ring. So welcome I these sounds and voices, these airs from far-off summer blown, this life that leaves me not alone 
for the white glory over Osme, the crystal terror of the seer of chibar's vision blinds me here rebuke me not o sapphire heaven thou stainless earth lay not on me this keen reproach of purity let the strange frost-work sink and crumble and let the loosened tree-boughs swing till all their bells of silver ring shine warmly down thou sun of noontime on this chill pageant melt and move the winter's frozen heart with love and soft and low thou wind south blowing breathe through a veil of tenderest haze thy prophecy of summer days come with thy green relief of promise and to this dead cold splendour bring the living jewels of the spring end of the pageant this recording is in the public domain The Golden Milestone by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Read by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona Leafless are the trees. Their purple branches spread themselves abroad like reefs of coral, rising silent in the red sea of the winter sunset. From the hundred chimneys of the village, like the Afrit in the Arabian story, smoky columns tower aloft into the air of amber. At the window winks the flickering firelight. Here and there the lamps of evening glimmer, social watchfires answering one another through the darkness. On the hearth the lighted logs are glowing. And, like Ariel in the cloven pine tree, for its freedom groans and sighs the air imprisoned in them. By the fireside there are old men seated, seeing ruined cities in the ashes, asking sadly of the past what it can ne'er restore them. By the fireside there are youthful dreamers, building castles fair with stately stairways, asking blindly of the future what it cannot give them. By the fireside, tragedies are acted, in whose scenes appear two actors only, wife and husband, and above them God, the sole spectator. By the fireside, there are peace and comfort, wives and children with fair, thoughtful faces, waiting, watching for a well-known footstep, in the passage, each man's chimney is his golden milestone, is the central point from which he measures every distance through the gateways of the world around him. In his farthest wandering, still he sees it, hears the talking flame, the answering night wind as he heard them, when he sat with those who were but are not. Happy he whom neither wealth nor fashion nor the march of the encroaching city drives an exile from the hearth of his ancestral homestead. We may build more splendid habitations, fill our rooms with paintings and with sculptures, but we cannot buy with gold the old associations. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Winter Piece by William Cullen Bryant Read for LibriVox.org by Todd The time has been that these wild solitudes, yet beautiful as wild, were trod by me oftener than now, and when the ills of life had chafed my spirit, when the unsteady pulse beat with strange flutterings, I would wander forth and seek the woods. The sunshine on my path was to me as a friend, the swelling hills, the quiet dells retiring far between, with gentle invitation to explore their windings, 
were a calm society that talked with me and soothed me. Then the chant of birds and chime of brooks and soft caress of the fresh sylvan air made me forget the thoughts that broke my peace. And I began to gather simples by the fountain's brink and lose myself in daydreams. While I stood in nature's loneliness, I was with one with whom I early grew familiar, one who never had a frown for me, whose voice never rebuked me for the hours I stole from cares I loved not, but of which the world deems highest to converse with her. When shrieked the bleak November winds and smote the woods, and the brown fields were herbless, and the shades that met above the merry rivulet were spoiled, I sought, I love them still. They seemed like old companions in adversity. Still there was beauty in my walks. The brook, bordered with sparkling frostwork, was as gay as with its fringe of summer flowers. Afar, the village with its spires, the path of streams and dim receding valleys, hid before by interposing trees, lay visible through the bare grove, and my familiar haunts seemed new to me. Nor was I slow to come among them, when the clouds from their still skirts had shaken down on earth the feathery snow, and all was white. The pure keen air abroad, albeit breathed no scent of herb, nor heard love call of bird, nor merry hum of bee, was not the air of death. Bright mosses crept over the spotted trunks, and the closed buds that lay among the boughs, instinct with life, patient, and wading the soft breath of spring, feared not the piercing spirit of the north. The snowbird twittered on the beechen bough, and neath the hemlock, whose thick branches bent beneath its bright cold burden, and kept dry a circle on the earth of withered leaves, the partridge found a shelter. Through the snow the rabbit sprang away. The lighter track of fox and the raccoon's broad path were there, crossing each other. From his hollow tree the squirrel was abroad, gathering the nuts just fallen, that asked the winter cold and sway of winter blast to shake them from their hold. But winter has yet brighter scenes. He boasts splendors beyond what gorgeous summer knows, or autumn with his many fruits and woods all flush with many hues. Come when the rains have glazed the snow and clothed the trees with ice, while the slant sun of February pours into the bowers a flood of light. Approach. The encrusted surface shall bear thy steps, and the broad arching portals of the grove welcome thy entering. Look, the massy trunks are cased in the pure crystal. Each light spray, nodding and tinkling in the breath of heaven, is studded with its trembling water drops that glimmer with an amethystine light. But round the parent stem the long low boughs bend in a glittering ring, and arbors hide the glassy floor. Oh! You might deem the spot the spacious cavern of some virgin mine deep in the womb of earth, where the gems grow, and diamonds put forth radiant rods and bud with amethysts and topaz, and the place lit up, most royally, with the pure beam that dwells in them. Or haply the vast hall of fairy palace, that outlasts the night and fades not in the glory of the sun, where crystal columns send forth slender shafts and crossing arches, and fantastic aisles wind from the sight and brightness, and are lost among the crowded pillars. Raise thine eye. Thou seest no cavern roof, no palace vault. There the blue sky and the white drifting cloud look in. Again the wilder fancy dreams of spouting fountains, frozen as they rose, and fixed, with all their branching jets, in air, and all their sluices sealed. All, all is light, light without shade but all shall pass away with the next sun. From numberless vast trunks loosened, the crashing ice shall make a sound like the far roar of rivers, and the eve shall close o'er the brown woods as it was wont. And it is pleasant when the noisy streams are just set free, and milder suns melt off the plashy snow, save only the firm drift in the deep glen or the close shade of pines. Tis pleasant to behold the wreaths of smoke roll up among the maples of the hill, where the shrill sound of youthful voices wakes the shriller echo, as the clear, pure lymph that from the wounded trees, in twinkling drops, 
falls, mid the golden brightness of the morn, is gathered in with brimming pails, and oft, wielded by sturdy hands, the stroke of axe makes the woods ring. Along the quiet air come and float calmly off the soft light clouds, such as you see in summer, and the winds scarce stir the branches. Lodged in sunny cleft, where the cold breezes come not, blooms alone the little wind flower, whose just opened eye is blue as the spring heaven it gazes at, startling the loiterer in the naked groves with unexpected beauty, for the time of blossoms and green leaves is yet afar. And ere it comes, the encountering winds shall oft muster their wrath again, and rapid clouds shade heaven, and bounding on the frozen earth shall fall their volleyed stores, rounded like hail and white like snow. And the loud north again shall buffet the vexed forest in his rage. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The First Snowfall by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone The snow had begun in the gloaming, and busily all the night had been heaping field and highway with a silence deep and white. Every pine and fir and hemlock wore ermine too dear for an earl, and the poorest twig on the elm tree was ridged inch deep with pearl. From Shed's new roof with Carrara came Chanticleer's muffled crow. The stiff rails were softened to swans down and still fluttered down the snow. I stood and watched by the window the noiseless work of the sky and the sudden flurries of snowbirds like brown leaves whirling by. I thought of a mound in sweet Auburn where a little headstone stood how the flakes were folding it gently as did robins the babes in the wood up spoke our little mabel saying father who makes it snow and i told of the good old father who cares for us here below again i looked at the snowfall and thought of the leaden sky that arched o'er our first great sorrow when that mound was heaped so high I remembered the gradual patience that fell from that cloud like snow, flake by flake, healing and hiding, the scar of our deep plunged woe. And again to the child I whispered, the snow that husheth all, darling the merciful father, alone can make it fall. Then with eyes that saw not I kissed her, and she kissing back could not know, that my kiss was given to her sister, folded close under deepening snow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In School Days by John Greenleaf Whittier Read for LibriVox.org by Carrie Adams Your Book Voice Still sits the schoolhouse by the road, a ragged beggar sunning. Around it still the summocks grow, and blackberry vines are running. Within the master's desk is seen, deep scarred by raps official, the warping floor, the battered seats, the jackknife's carved initial, the charcoal frescoes on its wall, its doors worn sill betraying the feet that creeping slow to school went storming out to playing it touched the tangled golden curls and brown eyes full of grieving of one who still her steps delayed when all the school were leaving for near her stood the little boy her childish favor single his cap pulled low upon a face where pride and shame were mingled. Pushing with restless feet the snow, to right and left he lingered, as restlessly her tiny hands the blue-checked apron fingered. 
He saw her lift her eyes. He felt the soft hand's light caressing and heard the tremble of her voice as if a fault confessing. I'm sorry that I spelt the word. I hate to go above you because the brown eyes lower fell. Because, you see, I love you. Long years ago, a winter sun shone over it at setting, lit up its western window panes, and low eaves icy fretting. Still memory to a gray-haired man, that sweet child face is showing. Dear girl, the grasses on her grave have forty years been growing. He lives to learn in life's hard school how few who pass above him lament their triumph and his loss, like her, because they love him. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Snow Shower by William Cullen Bryant Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Stand here by my side and turn, I pray, On the lake below thy gentle eyes. The clouds hang over it, heavy and grey, And dark and silent the water lies. And out of that frozen mist the snow In wavering flakes begins to flow. Flake after flake, They sink in the dark and silent lake. See how in a living swarm they come From the chambers beyond that misty veil. Some hover a while in air, And some rush prone from the sky like summer hail all dropping swiftly or settling slow meet and are still in the depths below flake after flake dissolved in the dark and silent lake here delicate snow stars out of the cloud come floating downward in airy play like spangles dropped from the glistening crowd that whiten by night the milky way there broader and burlier masses fall the sullen water buries them all flake after flake all drowned in the dark and silent lake and some as on tender wings they glide from their chilly birth cloud dim and grey are joined in their fall, and side by side, come clinging along their unsteady way, as friend with friend, or husband with wife, makes hand in hand the passage of life. Each mated flake soon sinks in the dark and silent lake. Lo, while we are gazing in swifter haste stream down the snows till the air is white as myriads after myriads madly chased they fling themselves from their shadowy height the fair frail creatures of middle sky what speed they make with their grave so nigh flake after flake to lie in the dark and silent lake I see in thy gentle eyes a tear, They turn to me in sorrowful thought. Thou thinkest of friends, the good and dear, Who were for a time, and now are not. Like these fair children of cloud and frost, That glisten a moment, and then are lost. Flake after flake, all lost in the dark and silent lake. Yet look again, for the clouds divide, A gleam of blue on the water lies, And far away, on the mountain side, A sunbeam falls from the opening skies, But the hurrying host that flew between, The cloud and the water, no more is seen. 
flake after flake at rest in the dark and silent lake end of poem this recording is in the public domain Woods in Winter by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk When winter winds are piercing chill And through the hawthorn blows the gale With solemn feet I tread the hill That overbrows the lonely vale O'er the bare upland and away Through the long reach of desert woods the embracing sunbeams chastely play and gladden these deep solitudes where twisted round the barren oak the summer vine in beauty clung and summer winds the stillness broke the crystal icicle is hung where from their frozen urns mute springs pour out the river's gradual tide shrilly the skater's iron rings and voices fill the woodland side alas how changed from the fair scene when birds sang out their mellow lay and winds were soft and woods were green and the song ceased not with the day but still wild music is abroad pale desert woods within your crowd and gathering winds in hoarse accord amid the vocal reeds pipe loud chill airs and wintry winds my ear has grown familiar with your song i hear it in the opening year i listen and it cheers me long end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Snowstorm by Ralph Waldo Emerson Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Announced by all the trumpets of the sky Arrives the snow, and, driving o'er the fields, Seems nowhere to alight. The whited air hides hills and woods, The river and the heaven, and veils the farmhouse at the garden's end the sled and traveller stopped the courier's feet delayed all friends shut out the housemates sit around the radiant fireplace enclosed in a tumultuous privacy of storm come see the north wind's masonry out of an unseen quarry evermore furnished with tile the fierce artificer curves his white bastions with projected roof round every windward stake or tree or door speeding the myriad handed his wild work so fanciful so savage nought cares he for number or proportion mockingly on coop or kennel he hangs parian wreaths a swan-like form invests the hidden thorn fills up the farmer's lane from wall to wall maugre the farmer's size and at the gate a tapering turret overtops the work and when his hours are numbered and the world is all his own retiring as he were not leaves when the sun appears astonished art to mimic in slow structures stone by stone built in an age the mad wind's night work the frolic architecture of the snow end of poem this recording is in the public domain midnight mass for the dying year by henry wadsworth longfellow read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone yes the year is growing old and his eye is pale and bleared death with frosty hand and cold plucks the old man by the beard sorely sorely the leaves are falling falling 
solemnly and slow call call the rooks are calling it is a sound of woe a sound of woe through woods and mountain passes the winds like anthems roll they are chanting solemn masses singing pray for this poor soul pray pray and the hooded clouds like friars tell their beads in drops of rain and patter their doleful prayers but their prayers are all in vain all in vain there he stands in the foul weather the foolish fond old year crowned with wild flowers and with heather like weak despised lear a king a king then comes the summer light day bids the old man rejoice his joy is last oh the old man grey loveth that ever soft voice gentle and low to the crimson woods he saith to the voice gentle and low of the soft air like a daughter's breath pray do not mock me so do not laugh at me and now the sweet day is dead cold in his arms it lies no stain from its breath is spread over the glassy skies no mist or stain then too the old year dieth and the forests utter a moan like the voice of one who crieth in the wilderness alone vex not his ghost then comes with an awful roar gathering and sounding on the storm wind from labrador the wind euroclidon the storm wind howl howl and from the forest sweep the red leaves away would the sins that thou abhorrest o soul could thus decay and be swept away for there shall come a mightier blast there shall be a darker day and the stars from heaven down cast like red leaves be swept away kyrie eleison christe eleison end of poem this recording is in the public domain end of winter poems by favorite american poets by john greenleaf whittier et al